So uh, welcome everyone to day one of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or we can, Climate Justice Forum. Um, and the name of the forum is Facing the Climate Emergency on the Road to COP27, Solutions and Perspectives from Global Women and Gender Diverse Leaders. Um, and we're presenting this forum during Climate Week at, and also the UN General Assembly taking place right now. Uh, my name is Osprey Oriel Lake, and I'm the executive director of WeCan, and I'm really honored to be here on Lenape, Tor Lenape Territory, which is right here in Manhattan. Uh, we're on the ground, our whole team, for Climate Week with both virtual and in-person events and actions. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to be here and also be presenting in a, in a variety of formats. And again, if you're just joining us, please be welcome to put your name and where you're from in the chat. It's really exciting. We have people from Mozambique, from all over the United States, uh, from the Canary Islands. Um, we, we welcome all of you. Um, and as we um, begin this, this three-day forum, I wanted to thank our incredible organizing team who have put in hours and hours of beautiful heart and soul into producing this three-day forum. Catherine Quaid, Ashley Gardardo, and Marquia Thomas, thank you all so very much. So let's just take a deep breath. There's a lot going on in the world right now. And, and just remember our beautiful earth under our feet and the skies above us and just be held um, within the context of nature as we are having many different experiences in different contexts. Um, we are at a choice point for humanity. The scientists of the IPCC reports confirm what we all know to be true that with no significant action, the climate crisis will continue to escalate quickly. And there's no question why our youth are marching in the streets all over the world, hollering at the top of their lungs, climate emergency. And every day we can see for ourselves, forest fires burning, massive flooding, extreme droughts, people losing their livelihoods and lives. And yes, we are in a climate emergency. So as the world prepares for COP27 in Egypt this September, we know solutions exist that can mitigate the worst impacts of the climate crisis and that women, feminists, and gender diverse organizers are truly leading the way. And that's why WeCan is hosting this Climate Justice Forum to uplift women and community-led solutions, strategies, policies, and frameworks. It is code red for humanity. And we are drawing a red line to say no more sacrifice people, no more sacrifice countries, no more sacrifice zones. This is a time to unite together to build a healthy and equitable future we know is possible for each other and our earth. On every continent, women land defenders are rising. And in some cases, these land defenders are literally putting their bodies and lives on the line to protect mother earth, our communities, and all that we really hold dear. And I really wanna honor these women and two spirit land defenders and bring light to the struggles and solutions of many, many courageous leaders. And, and to note that there really is a historical connection to the violence against women and the violence against mother earth and that we can't afford to ignore this, this violence and it really needs to be healed. It's systemic. I ask you to join me in celebrating and standing in solidarity with our movements around the world rising as caretakers and as protectors and defenders of our precious planet and our communities. Um, nature has made it crystal clear that we're not gonna buy or negotiate our way out of the multiple crises we face. So we need different paradigms. It's critical to radically imagine a world that we know is possible. And I say this because as stability in the current system falters, this is actually time where new ways of thinking, visioning, and being can have a considerable impact. Even ideas and policies that seem too radical before can take hold because there is a crack in these systems. And importantly, the pressure and insight of global people's movements are central to pushing for transformative and bold leadership right now because we really don't yet have the politics in place to tackle our multiple interlocking crises. So we need to respect and draw upon the knowledge and leadership of indigenous black and brown and frontline women and feminists who are already deeply engaged in solutions. Our forum today is calling for urgent action within a climate justice framework. And this week during the UN General Assembly, as world governments meet, 
we are delivering a powerful call to action for governments and financial institutions globally. This call to action is based on demands from our 2021 Women's Climate Justice Assembly, signed by 120 organizations representing millions of people around the world. And in the call to action, we are speaking out in recognition of the sacred interdependence of life on earth and with the knowledge that business as usual and extractive economic models predicated on fossil fuel extraction and deforestation have ushered in an era of planetary destruction. And we are gonna put the um, call to action in the chat so that you can all see that. We call on governments and financial institutions at COP27 and beyond to steadfastly commit to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees through policies that prioritize social, racial, and economic justice for all. Our call to action for gender justice, racial justice, upholding indigenous rights and rights of nature, calling for a just transition, and immediately keeping fossil fuels in the ground is an ongoing agenda for people and planet. It's an urgent call for our very survival. False solutions, white supremacy, colonization, and patriarchy have no place in any climate action plan. Rather, it's imperative that governments and financial institutions adopt just transition and feminist policies and frameworks. We are calling on governments to respect the right to freedom of expression and peaceful protest and to immediately halt the criminalization of land defenders whose efforts are central to a climate just world. Our call to action is addressed to both governments and the financial sector, as these entities, as we know, are working in tandem with each other and they enable each other's actions and policies. So we really hope that you will help us share out this call to action as we really demand a climate emergency globally. We are rising, we are not waiting, we can act now and we must act now. And thank you all again for the work that you all do, all of you who are listening in. I know many of you are doing incredible work in your own communities, and we thank you for joining us. So now I want to welcome this outstanding group of leaders who are presenting on the panel. And I wanna thank you all for your important work, taking time with us today. Thank you for your leadership. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, we wanted to kick off the Climate Justice Forum with this panel called African Feminist Perspectives on COP27 and Beyond. Um, we think it's very important that this is how to begin the conversation. It's vital that we, as we head into COP27 on the African continent, that we are rooted in the struggles and solutions of African women and feminist leaders. So please let me go ahead and present the speakers to you, um, uh, and then we will hear from each of them. We're gonna hear from Sostin Naman Ya, Program Officer of Gender and Food Security at the National Association of Professional Environmentalists, NAPE, from Uganda. Um, and then we will be hearing from Nima Namadamu. She is the founder of Synergy of Congolese Women Associations, and we're very honored that she is a Democratic Republic of Congo coordinator for the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network We Can. Thank you for joining us, both of you. And then we will be hearing from Anne Sangale from the climate, who is the climate justice coordinator from the African Women's Development and Communications Network, FEMNET in Kenya. So glad to have you here with us, Anne. And then we will be hearing from Rita Uwaka, who is the forest and biodiversity program coordinator from Friends of the Earth Africa from Nigeria. And we're so glad to have her here with us. So this is an incredible, group of feminists, women leaders uh, from Africa, and I hand the floor to you, Sostine. Thank you so much for joining us, Sostine. Thanks, Osprey, for that uh, good introduction. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are, and good afternoon. My name is Sostine Namanya, and I hope you can hear me. Clearly. If you could talk a little louder, a little louder. Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Asosti Namanya and uh, I'm based in Uganda. I work with the National Association of Professional Environmentalists and uh, I'll be speaking on the panel about what we actually need to do uh, going to COP26. I think for me, I will just mention four things. And the first thing is about the fact that we need to interrogate what the African governments are going to do at COP27. Are they actually going to do the right demands that we need. Because
because there is a difference between uh, what are the government's demands, but also what are the citizens' demands. So we need to interrogate what actual progress looks like in terms of, for example, when you look at the 100 billion uh, pledge for climate financing, it's in form of loans, it's in form of grants. But do we think this is really, really progress? How do our governments arrive at such decisions? I think for me, that's very key and important. And uh, we also have a big challenge. And this challenge is about the capitalistic model of government that is market driven. And I think also we talked about it in her remarks. And um, this is very important because we see climate financing having an element of the capitalistic model of development that is putting part of the money in that basket. So the question is, um, how do we make sure that COP27 also defines what climate financing is? And uh, is it loans? Is it grants? And uh, as people from the African continent, it's also important to know if uh, everything has already been decided on our behalf. So for us going to COP27, I think it is very critical, it's very pertinent that we need to know what we are going to do in COP27 when it comes to climate financing. And uh, also our leaders on the African continent, sometimes they actually accept these loans. And the reason why they expect these loans is because they need these loans because of the poverty that is existing and all that. And uh, I think for me, my solution and proposition would be very key that we need to look at how we transform other policies when it comes also the economic model that we have, when it comes to climate policies that we have. I think for me, that's also very important. And the other second point I would want to put across is uh, the issue of participation. I think we need to strengthen women's participation. And when I talk about participation, I'm talking about meaningful participation so that women can be able to debate and be heard. And then we can be able to qualify that as participation. Um, my third point also would be about the fact that already women on the African continent, but also in the global south and around the world, is that women are already defining what they think is the yes to development. And uh, it is important that women are also saying you not know, the type of development that they do not want or the solutions that are not contributing or are reducing or keeping us within the 1.5 Celsius as a uh, mentioned. So it is very important that we look at, for example, uh, activities or alternatives that women are saying yes to, for example, uh, indigenous ways of food production, community forest management, alternative energies, so that at COP27 we center women-led alternatives to the climate crisis and their solutions are put as major and centered in all the conversations that we are having. And also making sure that this is a communal alternative. We need alternative economies that are based on community, not also on uh, individuals. So for me, that is also very important that women, local alternative solutions are centered and they are able to be say that we develop or support the local yes ways of you know, solving the climate change uh, uh, crisis. And uh, I think my last point would also be about the fact that we need to educate the masses. I know some people might be like, okay, people already know climate change and the experience in this. But I think it is important that we educate the masses about uh, climate change and also the possible solutions of climate change like we are in this meeting. And this is very important so that we are able to overcome the decades of lies and misinformation that have been given out by corporations. And uh, if we do this, that means we are bringing everyone as our allies, we are bringing people who have an informed thinking and have an informed involvement in us solving the climate change and climate so I'll just leave it at that and uh, I'll hand over back to Osprey. Thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Sostine, uh, for your important comments and analysis. And we've put uh, a link to how to engage with Sostine in the chat for you to learn more about her work. And I'm really glad you're highlighting, um, you know, the issues around local solutions. And I think it's one of the things that often get overlooked is that women are engaged in local solutions that are working all over the world. And when you add up all of these solutions, 
they are very, very powerful and can actually address the climate crisis at its roots and its intersectional challenges. Um, and they often get overlooked because it's not this giant uh, corporate um, solution. And you know, I think we need to orient ourselves, as you're saying, to what's happening at the local level and really put forward community-led solutions often run by women um, because as you say, you know, this is this is an alternative to the systems that are not working that we often see at the COP. So I really appreciate your lifting that up. And with that, I'd like to, uh, before we bring Nima on, uh, she has a wonderful video. We're gonna go ahead and show the video and then we'll bring you on Nima and we look forward to your comments. So please go ahead, Ashley, if you could queue up that video and then we'll hear from Nima, thank you. I was the shock. When I come back here after 25 years, I really I was the shock. When I was a little girl, the forest was here. And when I was here, I see no more trees. Idea was how again people can bring life back. As the climate crisis increases, scientists are telling us that one of the most important things that we can do is to protect forests and biodiversity. The Congo Basin is one of the largest and most important forests of the world, only second to the Amazon in terms of size. And there, we are reforesting damaged lands, lands that due to extractive industries, agricultural business, have been completely turned into deserts. We have now 500 women, they are planting those trees. And if, when you're planting trees, you are on those trees and you are on, on the land. That is not usual on our culture, women to have some propriety, some ownership that give us really confidence. Seventy-five percent of the trees are going to rewilding the forest. Some of them now are 20 feet tall, and we're quickly seeing the forest begin to regenerate. And 25 percent are for human use, so that we can ensure that we're protecting the 1.6 million acres of old growth forest. This is where their food comes from, where their medicines come from, where the things they need for their homes come from, their pharmacy. Women, they are now protecting environment with trees, women of Itombe forest, natural forest from DRC. We are trying to protect our environment. We're now protecting 1.6 million acres of old growth forest over the years as we reforest in the Congo Basin. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a real need to develop more food sovereignty and food security. So now not only in the nurseries that we have are we planting sapling trees, but also lots of food for the local communities. Vegetables we did really help so much. People to have vegetables to fight with malnutrition. And the women are just so proud to not only be planting trees and healing their damaged homelands, but also protecting this old growth forest for all of us for doing their part in mitigating the climate crisis. So for all of these things, it's a very comprehensive project that's lifting up women, lifting up indigenous peoples and their traditional ways of life, protecting old growth forest and reforesting damaged lands. All of these forests, will become soon big one and we want to really to have again bring new oxygen wind will be stopping winds and it's really very 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 important 
betrays their life. Thank you so much for sharing that. And now we hand the floor to Nima Namadamu. You're on mute. Wow, uh, thank you so much. That is uh, the video from a long time ago. And let me tell you today, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good, good morning, is depend where you are. The world is moving around, around the earth. Some day are morning, some day are night, some day are afternoon, is how it is, it depends on where you are located in the world. That is my suggestion or my analyzing is a really critical time. Critical time we are in, especially uh, for us, we are in Africa. And also when you do introduction, you say no more sacrifice. But we live really with our authorities, the still on the colonizing mind. We live in 100%. If it is not more, uh, we live in that colonizing mind. That is number one. Our people think, okay, we have, is how the world is creating, is how the system, that patriarchal system, creating Africa. Africa serve other countries. And we, the, the world don't know, Africa is the mother continent. That is the number one people supposed to know. And this we are going, we are passing it through the climate change. This is the colonizing, it's like digital colonizing. People mind, they don't understand the solution is only in Africa, in particularity with women, because women, you can't separate women with a community. The community, the women, they are community. When you empower women, you empower whole community, whole nations. And the system, the patriarchal system and global system, when the colonizing come to Africa, first the things they did, religion stuff, they kill human beings, they kill women. That is all we are still suffering. We still suffering colonizing. That is where women, African women, we are suffering. But when we begin talking, we would say this is internet stuff. No one who hear, hear us where we are talking, especially in Congo. I'm from DRC Congo. I didn't do presentation. My name is Nema Namadamu. I'm from DRC Congo. If I have a real opportunity to talk about women, sometimes I become crazy. I became angry. I travel over the world talking about women issues. It's like climate change or climate change issues. If we can, I give you my proposal. Media, social media, if you can talk about climate change, like where they talk about COVID, we need to talk about climate change and we need to teach whole communities about climate change. We are suffering consequence without knowing why we are suffering because in DRC, in Africa, we live naturally. We don't have air conditioning. We don't have cleaning water. We don't have a medicine. Trees is the medicine we had. From long time, we didn't need pharmacies. We go to pharmacies. No, we have um, medwife. For example, on my community, we live in the forest at Itombe Forest. It's a natural forest in South Kivu Province in the Menga Territory. You can Google Itombe Natural Natural Forest of Itombe, and that is where we live. A long time when I was a little girl. We didn't need medicine. And like you see in the video, I'm a polio survival. Where I live, we don't have a medicine. It's not many hospitals. We, we don't have a wheelchair. We don't have a road. We don't have running water. 
Long time ago, we was living like a paradigms, but we have now conflict. Let me tell you about climate change and insecurity, how abusing women, like women today in Itombe, goes on the plantation doing food around Monusco camp. Monusco is a UN peacekeeper, military, UN military. And women, when we, we have this crisis about the COVID, women couldn't go plantation because they stopped uh, borders. We can't have food from outside. And it was a really big moment for us to see how we can fight it with hunger. And the women begin doing plantation, planting vegetables, giving kids because kids have malnutrition. Because those insecurity is mean in Africa, we don't have industry for making guns. In my region where I live, in Esti Congo, I don't know where is in Africa we have guns or we have industry making guns. But those guns die from on those country development countries. And they are coming with on tracking minerals and petroleum on the gas in Africa. And that they bring guns. Where, where my, my house is, where I live in a village, we don't have a road. We don't have a medicine. We don't have a school for kids. But we have a guns. We have a bombs. We have a grenade. And in Africa, it's not nowhere. Because the people living in the colonizing mind always. And I don't know how we can change this. But with climate change, I'm sorry I will be participate, but I'm not a really changing that system. It's a killing. It's a killing. Going only in the office, writing rules, writing the solutions, never made in practice. And it's time to acting and is it time to really talking. And we need women to be participating. And this climate change, we need maybe. 50-50, it's the first time we have this, no, it's the second time we have this meeting in Africa, Some, another time we have in Morocco, now is in Egypt, but we're still talking and the all money for climate change is going on the government, on those governments they are on colonizing mind. We don't see where is the money going. And women is still sacrifice, goes, on the plantation, no cars. They're putting things on the head. That is unbelievable. But people still only drinking wine and laughing on women when they're speaking. Last year, no, two years ago, I went to South Korea talking about women issues from Second World War. If it will be men issues, it will be finished completely. Now let us bring in our solution. First solution I'm thinking is how we can include more women on looking solution, on meetings. That is my one proposal I'm doing, how we can do magic to, do, to bring more leaders, women leaders who will talk truth who will not like, who working like not owners, like a commissioner. Let a whole world honor these issues we have because we will have one solution. We have one globally. This is global issues. Let all together resolve it together. But when uh, North countries bringing those war in Africa, taking, and this climate change doesn't have a border. How now together we can bring solutions? That is all we can need. We need. We we do. We did all sacrifice, all sacrifice. But the Western countries don't see our sacrifice. They think we don't see how they abusing Mother Earth, abusing women abusing na natural, like trees, everything, water, our liver, because we didn't have 
running water. We got always on the sourcing to bring water to drink on the sourcing. But right now you can't get clean water. And every people, population have now suffering cholera because they extracting minerals, they cleaning those minerals and with chemical. It's why you see whole world now having many disease and we don't know who, how and when and who, how to talk to let the system understand we are dying and we are in critical timing. And I don't know how we will change maybe language. I don't really know. That is where I can propose let really women and give support because we are that sacrifice. Our country, our continent sacrifice and whole people sacrifice that climate change sacrifice and young especially let me tell you young people african is really kind of you see how they are struggle struggle struggles and uh, i'm finished there if you have a question please uh, asking me but it's really critical time critical moment please let's we can get all together, we can get solution. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to see how we can little breathe about our issues. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Nima, for your powerful words and your passion and your dedication and all the work you're doing. And um, you know, just an honor to have you here. And you know, thank you for also talking about the the kind of intervention we need to have. From, from the ground, from the grassroots, from the women, and really advocating that women's voices need to be heard. We know, you know, in so many spaces, as you mentioned, you know, at the local level, at the national level, but, you know, at, at the COP, you know, where are all the women leaders? You know, the highest percentage of speakers at the COP are men and primarily white men. And mm -hmm. where are our voices? Where are your voices? We need to get um, you know, a very diverse group of women leaders, much more heard in these spaces where decisions are being made. So yeah. thank you very much for really highlighting that and talking about, you know, caring for, for people, caring for the women on the ground with their families and children. They're not just, you know, on a checkbox or a piece of paper. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I want to now turn to Anne Songoli and from the who's the climate justice coordinator from the African Women's Development and Communications Network or Femnet from Kenya. Thanks so much for joining us, Anne. The floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Osprey. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to come after Nema and Sostin. Thank you so much also for your comments. Osprey, just let me know if I'm audible. Um, or if I Perfect. Right. Okay. Um, so first of all, my name is Anne Songole. Um, the Climate Justice Coordinator at FEMNET, the African Women's Development and Communications uh, Network. Um, we're in 50 countries across Africa and um, we have over 800 members. Um, and I just came from, you know, the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment that was held in Senegal. And indeed, we did give input to the CSO statement that would go to the heads of state. And this would be the position that Africa, the Africa group would have at COP27. But what it is, what is it exactly that you want? So I'm going to share my presentation, just a brief presentation. Um, in the next few minutes just to share some of what we do and um you know just to share some of what we do uh and um yeah and to see what else i could say so first of all as i said i'm the climate justice coordinator at femnet um we have a climate justice and natural resource governance team so who is this climate justice that we're seeking for um, we're seeking climate justice for communities that are at the front lines of the crisis, for the Ogoni in the Niger Delta, whose life expectancy is low due to, you know, oil. Of course, we know it's the oil fields, yet they still need to transition to renewable energy. Mm 
for the Maasai and Somali communities in Kenya and of course in the whole of Africa who have to walk further and further away in search of pasture for you know for to for their nomadic lifestyles for all who are disproportion who disproportionately experience food and water shortages flooding displacements and other effects of extreme weather events special mention goes to Zimbabwe and Mozambique following cyclone Idai we know that there are so many of, from those communities who have still not you know, buried their dead. There are so many who still live in camps. For those whose culture and way of life have been or are, are on the verge of being destroyed due to the crisis, we know that small island and develop, developing states have a, a real challenge at this moment. Their cultures are being wiped off. Even in the coast of Senegal, we know this is happening. And we know that climate justice is also for the global south, whose opportunity cost to the crisis is actually development. So while others are using their GDPs for development, African states are using their GDPs to deal with the effects of the climate crisis. And not just that, this will deny communities public service. And so um, we do appreciate, um, I do appreciate the multilateral processes that have been put in place like the, you know, the convention, the UNFCCC convention, which birthed the Paris Agreement. But where is the accountability? For instance, two of the speakers spoke about the finance pledge and Osprey spoke about that as well. So where is the accountability? Where is, who, who will hold these people to account if um, these finance pledges are not met? Why mitigation and not adaptation? So um, why the capitalist approach? We know that markets are the interest of a lot of, you know, a, a lot of entities who attend COP. And we know that people who attend COP are a lot of capitalist entities. The lobbies that we saw at COP26, those are the people who attend COP27, who will attend the COP27. Those are the people who push for mitigation financing. And so why mitigation and not adaptation in this uh, multilateral process? And so what about loss and damage financing? The loss and damage agenda almost didn't make it to the COP27 uh, agenda. There had, to, there had to be a lot of work done for this to be on the agenda. So what's the cost of having this on the agenda? And why, why do we want to continue talking about empty finance pledges? And why do we want the loss and damage uh, financing to be there? As I said, the cost of the crisis on African states and other global South states is development. And that means public, public service for communities. Um, and so someone just said that the climate crisis is a result of a Cartesian materialist, patriarchal and racist ideological glitch. And I tend to agree. Why? Because as feminists, we take a structural view of the climate crisis. And we look at it as a problem that ar arose from industrialization. We know that the global north has industrialized from and has benefited from, you know, um, prior to the crisis. And we know that that has costed us. That is what has caused the crisis. And we know that the solutions currently being presented for, for the crisis, for instance, insurance, are not solutions that meet the needs um, and that uh, suit the context of um, populations. And we know that there's an, a lack of representation of voices from the global South of women, of indigenous community, uh, communities of vulnerable groups and other minorities. We know that that is a challenge at the, at the moment. And we know that there's the Paris Agreement, while it's, it's welcome, it's clear, it's watered down from the convention. And there's a lot of focus from, on the Paris Agreement as opposed to the convention. And we know that the climate burden is on the global south. We know that the countries of the global south are facing severe challenges. We've seen Pakistan in the last month, so many people have died. And in the course of there, we've seen so many other countries, floods in Durban, we've seen so many things happen. And so we know that that burden lies on um, countries that are considered the global south that cannot fully, um, um, fully mitigate the effects of the crisis. And so what are we saying? These countries of the global south are still the countries that are in climate debt. And so 
this this debt that is being caused by the climate crisis is we're trying to mitigate it we're trying to meet some of these issues with our nationally determined contributions but the truth is we will we are unlikely to do that there is a growing debt from the covid-19 crisis and there is also a, a growing debt from climate due to the opportunity cost that i spoke about earlier and so what about gender and women um of course, they're disproportionately affected. And, and you know, that disproportionate effect is, is not fully understood. It's an effect on their emotional well-being, on their material well-being. It's an effect, it has an effect on even um, who they are um, as people, as much as it has an effect on their livelihoods. And we know that minorities are marginalized further in indigenous communities, people who live in forests, communities that live in forests, we know that they're more marginalized, even as this crisis continues and even as um, solutions to the crisis are being fronted. And we know their voices, the voices of the indigenous are muffled. These folks are underrepresented in a lot of these spaces um, and in, COP, in the COPs in particular. Getting a visa is no mean feat. We know that the gender action plan and the gender focal points, these are not funded. And that's what we are calling for at COP27. We need this to be funded. Otherwise, what are these activities if they can't be funded? And of course, the, the, a critical issue of women's care work, which subsidizes economies. And this, um, it's unpaid. And we know that it's, it's not even a subject of the loss and damage uh, financing that we're talking about. It's not subject, it's not a subject of the just transition that we keep talking about. We know that these are not things that people talk about. And as we move further, we want to say that as African feminists, there are many things that we want, but we've consolidated this into a number of asks. I'll pick out of the asks that we have, I'll pick four of them. And so at COP27, this is what we want like many organizations want adaptation and loss and damage financing. And the first thing is we want, um, we endorse unconditional and debt-free climate financing that's gender responsive, flexible, and that's multi-year. And we don't want um, funding that's project oriented. We want funding that is available in a non-project way. We also want um, uh, investment in and promotion of locally led gender just and feminist climate solutions and movements that are anti-capitalist, decolonial, and of course, that are collectivized. We also want meaningful representation, which both the speakers before me spoke about. And this equitable representation of women and girls should be in the negotiations that are taking place at global spaces, at regional spaces, at national spaces, and at sub-national places spaces, and this should include frontline community women leaders. We also want debt cancellation and climate finance. I cannot stress this enough. We collectively demand for debt cancellation, reparations. Of course, these are not things that people want to hear, but that's the truth. Reparations for colonial debt that is existing and historic and ongoing emissions which have funded and continue to fund the development of the global north. We are seeing onslaught of a lot of a lot of organizations talking about gas as a transition fuel and we know that that is not the reality we want for africa but how will we get to the reality that we want for africa we also want a decolonial and just transition and so what we want is to advance a just transition as a common position for the continent that centers an eco-feminist future eco-feminism is about us being one with our environment. And so this transition should center an eco-feminist future for African women and girls in all their diversity and also in policy and decision-making. Uh, and so I think I'll stop there. But before I go, I want to say that as Feminet, what we are doing towards this is we're organizing what we call a feminist COP alongside the Climate Change and Development for Africa Conference, which will happen in Namibia in late October. And early in the year, we did organize an African Feminist Academy for Climate Justice. This is not enough though, and we are going to cope with a set of additional demands. Thank you, Osprey, back to you. Uh, thank you very, very much for that very powerful presentation, Anne, and to hear from the demands from uh, Femnet, and I'm sure representing, as you said, many, many others. 
Um, and I wanted just to highlight, you know, that it's very important for all of us who are going to the COP or in our own organizations to be able to lift up these demands from African feminists on the ground. And we've put into the chat a link to FemNet um, because we need to look to the leaders on the ground as we head into this COP. And as um, all of the speakers have said so for, far, and I'm sure Rita will bring this up in a moment, this um, inequity between the global North and South is another factor that we must, must strongly address. And this demand for financing of adaptation and loss and damage at this COP is critical. And, uh, you know, we're all as global movements needing to stress again and again this inequity um, and also um, to ensure again that, that uh, women's voices are heard in a feminist analysis and you brought forward really um, you know, this issue around uh, decolonial uh, frameworks. And again, to lift up that many feminists have been working in the space, whether through ecofeminism or other terminologies around a feminist care economy which is to look at an anti-capitalist future for our economy. And it also involves an um, anti-racist framework. And it's essential that we have these conversations, that we get above the noise, because the systems we're in, as we know, are not working. And mm -hmm. so I really appreciate the demands that you put forward because they're very tangible and they really um, name a lot of the things that many of us have been working on again through the women and gender constituency. And we can also put a link there because our um, calls to actions completely overlap and are led by uh, frontline women leaders such as yourself. And so um, we could also make a connection there to the fact of um, how important the gender action plan will be at the upcoming COP as, as countries review and we advocate for the demands that you put forward. So thank you very much for that presentation. And um, I know that we could listen to all of you for hours to unpack these things, but you know these are the seeds that we can plant today and share um, links so people can continue to learn more of these analyses that, sort of, that are so key. And with that, um, I invite uh, my dear friend, Rita Uwaka, uh, who's calling in from Nigeria. Um, again, she is a forest and biodiversity program coordinator from Friends of the Earth Africa in Nigeria. You have the floor, Rita. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Ospri, and to all the speakers who have um, made some remarkable comments about this discussion. Um, it's really amazing to be here. And Sustain and Nima, thanks sisters. It is very, very disheartening that when we're talking about climate crisis, you know, a lot of things are not considered in terms of the gender component, how this climate crisis is impacting women on the ground and everywhere around the world, especially when we're talking about just transition and it is not really just when it's not feminist. And, and as, made, made the mention of this because it's very critical that is important, is important for it to be based on eco-feminism. Um, because if it's not based, if it's not feminist, like we say in, in Friends of the Earth, if it's not feminist, then it's not just. Um, there are lots of things we need to consider as we go to COP. We need to understand that the idea of the drivers of climate crisis are not being given visibility. We are seeing a lot of corporate capture and corporate influence in the negotiation space. They are influencing a lot of text. They are having a lot of delegation, you know, intimidating order, you know, people that are part of the negotiation process and other interest within the the civil society space. And we think that this is one of the concerns that we need to take to COP. Um, COP has been co-opted by the corporations mm -hmm. and it's very disheartening. This capitalist model that is foiling a lot of human rights violations, social, environmental and gender violations in different territories, especially in Africa where you know, corporations are taking over land and resources, clearing 
forest, to plant a particular tree over a large expanse of land in the name of development. And they are seeing it as a solution. We're seeing MBS where nature-based solutions is now being considered as a new solution and a new bride to the climate crisis. And uh, we're seeing red, putting a price tag to a forest and locking it up, locking those that have been protecting it and have been custodian of this forest, uh, forested landscape, locking them out in the name of red and red plus. These are some of the concerns for solutions are now being promoted the more. Meanwhile, the real solutions are in the hands of the people, in the hands of the communities, in the hands of women. It's, it has to be louder than before. And the idea of agro-colonialism, which is the new form of colonialism and is ravaging many parts of Africa where a lot of forested land, even agricultural land, are made to fail under government protection. And when these fail, the companies come, the transnational companies, they come and say, oh, we want to revive it, you know, and they take it over. In taking it over, they expand into new areas, they clear virgin forest just to give way for industrial plantations. These are four solutions and they are considering it and they are collecting carbon credit from it. This is something that we continue, we need to continually highlight as we go to, uh, for COP. Uh, we need to promote community-led solutions, solutions that are just, that are feminist. Um, we need to speak against intimidation and violence against environmental human rights defenders. There are a lot of environmental human rights defenders, women environmental human rights defenders that are facing a lot of violence, facing a lot of intimidation, harassment, including sexual harassment. You know, women that are residing or living within these corporations, operations are uh, being molested in one way or the other. And this is something that a lot of people are not talking about. There has to be protection for those that are protecting the environment. Uh, we need to look into demand system change. The system is already beyond fixing. We can't fix it. And that's why we say we want system change. And that means we need to dismantle patriarchy because all of these systems of oppression are founded on patriarchy. And when we are calling for system change, we are saying we are dismantling patriarchy, colonialism, new colonialism, all forms of destructive and oppressive tendencies that undermine the rights of people, undermine the rights of, of the, um, that uh, destroy the environment and also, you know, dehumanize nature. Um, a lot of investments are going on, financing destructive, uh, you know, destructive projects. Yeah, all in the name of we are trying to attract, you know, some development concerns into the country and Africa seems to be the, the bride of it all. They open their hands, our government are opening their hands to different financing from different so-called corporations that want to invest. And this is, is causing more harm because the people that are supposed to, to um, this funding is supposed to be for, private, for public interest, but most of the time the interest is private because there are more destructive practices that force climate crisis, like deforestation, oil exploration, that is causing a lot of multiple social, environmental, and gender impacts, oil spillage, you know destroying water bodies, polluting water bodies, destroying crops, farmland, fish ponds of locals, of women, of families that depend on these, you know, as their own way of livelihoods. So these destructive practices continue to receive more funding, you know, from multilateral agencies, from financial institutions, at the detriment of our environment at the detriment of communities and people, especially women who suffer multiple impacts, you know, multiple impacts of these, of these uh, operations of these companies. 
system change, we say we have to demand agroecology is one of the solutions we want to take to the to, to, to COP27. We need to put the production, food production in the hands of smallholders, peasant farmers, fisher folks, family farming. We need to, we need to encourage that. Agroecology is a solution that we are projecting because not agro commodities that relies so much on uh, agrochemicals that destroy the environment, that poor climate crisis through increased deforestation and all of that. We say no to all of that. We need to clean, we need to tell corporations like we've continually done in the past and the present. And you know, I like some of the recommendations that uh, Anne gave. You know, the Niger data, for instance, is, is like an eyesore because of the years, many years of pollution that has taken place as a result of the operations of these multinational oil companies. And this is a serious issue in the Niger Delta. You know, communities have been sacked as a result of you know, pollution, oil spill, gas flaring. Imagine a company coming out to say that one of the economic benefits of gas flaring is that the women of the Niger Delta, they're using the flares from the gas point to dry their wares, to dry. You can imagine poisoned food. They are considering it as a livelihood alternative when women in those areas are giving back to deformed babies they are, they are getting a lot of, uh, inhaling a lot of carcinogenic substances that led to the untimely death. And this is a concern that we need to, to consider. A lot of places we are seeing our corporations are influencing policies and practices on the ground, how they are silencing environmental human rights defenders who are speaking truth to power, we're seeing how they are, you know, above the law, especially in many African countries where these executives or corporations can walk into the executive governor of a state without even a pass. And because they are more like the ones running the government. And that's the same thing that is happening at the COP space. We have corporations taking over, hijacking a lot of the processes, a lot of the discussion, manipulating the text of the different negotiations and all of that. And we need to kick them out. Over the years, we've been saying we want them out. Kick polluters out, let the people in. That's one of the messages we keep saying year in, year out. And we need to continue to revibrate and continue to announce this because um, they continue to pay deaf ears to us. And um, another thing I'd like to also mention is um, we need to be united as civil society organizations because the companies are using a lot of civil society organizations, manipulating them, even funding some of them to, to be able to promote, promote the solutions, the so-called solutions that they are bringing to the table. And this is a very bad uh, precedent because this will affect our work as feminists, it will affect our work as environmentalists and environmental human rights defenders. We need to find a way to continually uh, expose and bring awareness to most of our civil society organizations that may be uh, co-opted into the false solution agenda of these corporations. And remember I said at the beginning, if the concept of just transition is not feminist, is not just. Because we cannot be talking about climate, um, uh, climate justice without gender justice. And we cannot be talking about gender justice without women. So we need to own that and we need to continue to speak truth to power against all the oppressive tendencies to silence environmental human rights defenders and to relegate the solutions we bring to the table. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Rita, so much for that analysis and your incredible, insightful um, words and pointing out many different issues. 
Um, I want to encourage people to put questions into the chat so we can ask uh, our presenters your questions. So I'm looking in the chat for your questions. But I just, uh, while people are typing in the chat their questions, I wanted to just reflect on some of the comments by Rita. Um, um, thank you very much for pointing out how um, people need to be extremely aware of what is um, being put forward as solutions and the difference between solutions that are being offered that even sound good, like nature-based solutions. It sounds like a great title, but as you dig into it, and many of us have been through these conversations with financial institutions and governments and other entities that, you know, we don't want the commodification of nature. We don't want nature in the marketplace. We want real solutions that stop pollution at the source, not carbon offsets where companies basically buy carbon offsets someplace away and continue polluting or harm communities that we see across Africa um, while the carbon offsets happen in their communities or indigenous peoples are displaced from their forest. So another company can, uh, can uh, buy carbon offsets and continue to pollute. So I really appreciate you highlighting that people need to really know what these false solutions are and see that there is not only a co-option of the UN by corporate actors, but also our language. So I also appreciate that you brought forward the fact of the terminology of a just transition. That can also be co-opted. We need to keep identifying and being really clear. What do we mean by just transition? What do we mean by climate justice? Is it truly gender just? Is it decolonized? Is it racially just? Is it economically just? So we have a lot of work to uh, continue to operate in these spaces, advocate, but also um, really claim our language and claim our terminology and ensure that the voices of the people are heard and what it is that we're saying. And so I think it's very important that you highlighted these points. Um, I'm looking for any questions in the chat. And I would also just like to point out, since it was mentioned earlier, just for people to, to, to kind of see why people on this call are really advocating for gender representation, only 35% of the named party delegates at COP26, the last COP26, were women. So we're only at 35% just in terms of party delegates. So those are that's way too low of a number, like basically a third. So we've got a ways to go to um, really ensure that there is proper representation of women's leadership. And, you know, we don't have time on this particular panel. And it wasn't the purpose of it. But Catherine, if you could please put into the chat our link to why women are key to the solutions around climate and also our Women Speak uh, um, online database for those of you who might want to know why are we pushing so hard for women's leadership? Well, it turns out you cannot get to sustainability. You cannot get to a thriving future without women's leadership. It's not just that it's fair and ethical. You actually can't win without women at the table. And you need particularly those who have been on the front lines, which means indigenous black and brown women having a full seat at the table to share their struggles and solutions. So you can look at that analysis in some of the links as to why this is so urgent and critical. Um, I'm looking for questions. And meanwhile, I'm going to ask a question of the panelists um, as we head into COP26. I would love to hear from you. You know, um, you gave us great points already about how to prepare and think about the upcoming COP. Um, what would you suggest um, for people who are um, not going to be at COP, what can they do to really engage in, in these processes? Because I know a lot of times people feel removed from any sort of interaction um, with, with what governments are doing. And what would you suggest people do so we can create the movements and the people power that we need to push at this COP for more urgency and the demands that you've put forward. And maybe we could just go around in the order that everyone spoke. We could um, go to you, Sostine, first and then go through what, what you would like people to know. Uh, thanks, Osprey. I think for me, my answer to that would be the fact that when we talk about women and girls bearing the blunt of the climate change, 
some people think this is a joke or this is a cliche. So if you are at home and not going to call, but you need to keep vocalizing that as important when it comes to amplifying that women and girls are actually facing the climate crisis more than other things. That's my message. Thank you so much, Sostine. Nima? Thank you so much. Uh, what is your question? Uh, you can repeat again, please. Sure. The question is that, um, you know, as we get ready for the COP, we need our voices to be stronger and stronger. And some people will be at the COP and some people won't. So for people who won't be at the COP, but want to engage and have governments hear what is needed and what the directions of our climate justice movement are and our gender justice movements, and how we're really going to have more equitable representation. What, what would you suggest people do or what is your message to people about that? My message to people about it that we need the really women voice, global voice for women and girls. For example, you can't, for example, in my region, I'm only in East Congo, maybe two women. What I know already is two women. One is from Kinshasa, another is from me, I'm from East Congo. And we need to have more globally voice to represent other women because women, they are on the ground. Women, they are solutions. In the community is them who plant trees, is women who do all community because other men, they are fighting for title, for money, for big position, but women, they are on the ground. We are in the grassroots organization. That is where we need really more presentation. And also let I don't know how we can do, and the world can hear us. We are like four women here, you see in, in, in this panel, but we represent maybe millions and millions of women voice, especially black women, and black indigenous people. They don't really, they, no one who remind them. One time I asked a man in Kinshasa, why you are not include the women? And they say, Neymar forgives me. We don't really remember when we are preparing. We are not on the mind. They don't invite in. We, they don't, they, it's not because they don't like us, no. They don't remember us. In the system, we, they are not exist. Is how he told me. I say, why this? Why every time you missing us on a negotiating table? And they say, I'm sorry, forgive me. We don't remember you guys. And he told me like a joke, but for me it was a serious question. That is where we want to have a really more women to be participate. If in the government and also not to participate, only participate to show numbers. No, we want, for example, our government. If I will be participating, not from my government, I'm from other organizations, civil society organizations from Weekend International. I'm not from Congo government. And other women who I know, my friend, they are coming to COP27, is not coming from government. That is the sacrifice we are doing working with sacrifice, but the delegation from government will be having everything and going on a table negotiating, but they don't know where they are negotiating. Only they have the paper, but on the ground, there are women who are working. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nima. I really appreciate it. And also, you know, you reminded me too, how it's so important that it's not just about numbers and including women. We need women with a feminist analysis. You know, it's yes. not just putting, it's 50% women and 50% men. Plus there's also gender diversity, including people across the gender spectrum. But it's exactly. also that we want, you know, feminists and women at the table with a deep analysis that's about structural change. It's not just a numbers game. So this is also important. Um, Anne, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, as, of course, in solidarity with all the sisters before me have said, um, but I wrote down two things. So 
we need to, as people who are not going to COP, some people will not be going to COP, and we know this one is really restricted. So you need to understand climate, the effects of climate change, and the linkage between climate, climate and the crisis that you see around you. So just, you know, just a deliberate effort to think through, you know, how is this climate crisis affecting you? Um, but I also think you need to be part of movements. There are so many movements all across. There are people on the ground who are doing many different things that are very important. And you could be, as part of the movement, someone who would further, you know, the agenda for, um, uh, you know, a fair, a fair share of climate action. Um, and then you need to also craft your narrative. So... You need to think about how is climate affecting me as a person, as my community, and what's the narrative, what's the dominant narrative about climate change in my community. So thinking about that will also help you put things in perspective, and it will also help you kind of debunk some of the myths that will definitely be coming from COP27. Um, yeah, just understanding the, the linkages and, and all that, I feel that's really important for you to do. But also for, for you to also think about how you can document, you know, craft your narratives, document, and make sure that this is very clear to you. Make a deliberate effort of also engaging some of the um, movements and some of the members of your community who are engaged in some this, the community-based organizations and other folks who are engaged in some of these climate um, debates, some of the climate issues. Um, if you know anyone who's attended COP and they come back home, Tag, I mean, go to them, ask them, you know, what happened, how was your experience, and find ways in which you can also plug into a lot of these processes. Uh, back to you, Osprey, thanks. Thank you so much for those important comments, Anne. Rita, please go ahead. Thank you for uh, to all the amazing uh, comments, all the people that have spoken on this. I think it's very important, you know, there are a lot of... Um, disadvantages that we see with communities at the front line who do not even have the opportunity to be seen or heard at the COP space. Those are the priority I think we need to uh, look into. We need to find a way to uh, amplify the voices of these people, women who have been impacted by this climate crisis, whose lands have been taken away, who have been forced to migrate from their homes as ancestral homes to another location as a result of maybe flooding, as a result of land grabbing and deforestation for agro-commodities expansion. You know, all of these as a result of oil pollution, we need to hear the voices of these women at the cop space if they can be there. We can do a video like a documentary to listen to them. So that can be organized maybe during a side event at the COP space where people will listen and it can able, even be sent, you know, to the, have a way to be played at the negotiation space if need be. But we can have a side event where we collect the testimonies of impact, impacted women in the different territories. I don't know, it's, it's such a, a short time from now on, but I think that's one of the priorities we can give in order for, you know, the voices of our women and those that are impacted by climate crisis to be heard at such a space. Then we need to also amplify the comments and voices of women who will be participating at the COP. For example, we can link them to responsible media organizations who can you know, listen to whatever they're going to say in terms of the feminist perspective, in terms of the solutions they're bringing to the COP. That can be a way to also amplify you know, the concerns that you're going to, to be raising. And also social media, you can contribute you know, by spreading the word, the messages that are going to be there and all of that. So I think that's, that's part of what I think we should uh, focus on as for those that will not be able to be there, you can contribute in one way to also amplify the voices and contribute towards giving a voice 
to frontline women at the grassroots. Thank you so much, Rita. Really important. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I know uh, from being at that COP, it makes a really big difference um, if, you know, people who are caring about the climate crisis and want to get engaged and they're not at the COP, as you pointed out, they can help with amplification. So all of you listening and through your networks, um, you know, all of the women here, I know will have social media about the work that they're doing at the COP, what they're advocating for. We've put their links into the chat. We can, we'll be doing live streams and many other groups in the women and gender constituency, all kinds of different leaders will be, you know, from the grassroots, from women leaders that we're hearing about and that all of uh, these panelists have mentioned will be very active on their social media platforms. And that can also create pressure to governments if more and more people are amplifying those messages and we need to use social media to amplify our advocacy. So I really like that. And I think it's something that we can do that everyone can do so that we become louder, which we need to be at this point. Um, there's a really important question I wanted to come back to and it was something also that intrigued me um, in so many ways coming back to you, Anne, about the discussion about non-project form of climate finance and how do we distribute funds is the question. How do you imagine this locally led process work to avoid more harm to the most vulnerable women in our communities? Um, and would this fund be coming from multilateral institutions like the UN or, um, I'm not sure what, what the other part of the question was, sorry. Um, but it, it's around, you know, could you talk to us more about this non-project form of climate finance, which we all know in the world that we operate in is like really key and hard to get. But please go ahead, Anne. Um, okay, yeah. So there was a, actually a call by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights a few months ago on loss and damage. They just wanted to collect views about a loss and damage facility. And um, we sent it to our members. As I said, Net FemNet is a membership network. And we got their views on what they feel a loss and damage facility could look like. So there's community resilience and then there's uh, infrastructure, you know, and resilient economies. So when we're thinking about community resilience, some of the ways that have, some of the things that have worked from some of the organizations that are giving grants. For instance, the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, they give small grants to certain individuals. These grants are supposed to help them think through you know, their, local, their locally led solutions. And it's just, it's a grant that comes every so often that they're assured of that will make, that will uh, provide them with a way um, they can deal with the crisis within, you know, at that level, at that individual level. So that grant financing can come from different entities. Um, I'm not sure that it would be good. It could even come from the government. It possibly could, but you know, governments are in debt. So we know if you give them money, it will just go elsewhere. So the truth is this granting, these grants could come through um, NGOs um, and it could also come through uh, I mean, it could be an arrangement between NGOs and 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 co and some of these funders. Um, I'm not sure about the World Bank Group and how they fund because one of the things that I one of the disadvantages of also um, the World Bank Group financing or the AFDB financing is that we see that they like to give financing after a decision has already been made at COP27. That that would take time. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved. Um, but still just coming back to uh, financing, it would have to be very feminist, it would have to be flexible, it would have to be um, trust-based, it would have to be looking at ends that are beyond, you know, what project financing look, looks like, um, and see it would, it would have to be um, a stream of income that is assured, like what we see in countries like Kenya and Senegal and many others in Africa where they give social protection, where they give funding and social protection. They give money for the elderly, money for certain people. What we actually see in the US, you know, money for um, certain people 
um, you know, people who can't afford certain things. So I think those are some things we could that you know could be put on the table. But since the definition of climate finance is being put on the table, I think this is a good time to put that question in. How would non-grant financing look like for the new collective quantified goal uh, on climate finance? Um, and how would it look like also for the informal economies of Africa? For instance, we know that it's women who run a lot of the markets and we know that they're affected the same way. So it could they could use market and non-market mechanisms, but we would prefer that they use non-market mechanisms even for the informal private sector. Yeah, I think that's what I would say for now. Ah, uh, thank you very much uh, for your insight, Anne, and and uh, taking us into a deeper understanding of how that would take place. And and again, you know, just at a, a, a sort of a a different level is you know how when it's again about disrupting these power structures. So when funds are given, they're given to these uh, groups, NGOs that you mentioned, uh, Anne, and others, where um, instead of the funders deciding how those funds need to be used or should be used, which is what we get caught up in with this project funding, that it's given in a general fund so that the people on the ground can direct where their funds go because they know where the money needs to go. It's another sort of disruption in the power structures and the economic structures that we need, that we see now where there's a need for people who are in the lived experience to you know, ensure that the funds go where they need to go. Um, I see Nima that you have your hand up and I know we're coming towards the, the close of our time. Yes. So right, please go ahead, Nima. I don't, I don't mean uh, to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask Catherine to please put into the chat the, uh, the uh, call to action that we've put out today because it covers a lot of these topics um, in a comprehensive way. And I just wanted to give people that analysis and, and sort of seeing like a connecting of the dot um, document. If you could put that in the chat again. Nima, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It's like the question, my dear sister, Anna, she answered, and you, you answer also, but we need the fund to go to women grassroots organization. And sometimes this climate change, they put the funds on the big corporations. And now the fund is subbed, subbed, and the money is going to be on the ground, nothing. Money is finishing on those big ground. But we need, we are on the ground and we can know how to direct the funds. Thank you so much for that question. It's a simple question. Thank you, Nima, for your important comment. And we are coming up to, to the close of our session. And I want to thank everyone who's joined us today um, and, and participating with us. But I want to hand it back to the panelists. Uh, you might feel complete. You might have something more that you wanted to say. You're very welcome to have any closing comment. Uh, we're not rushed. I just know that um, there's some of you who are in the middle of many sessions, and I don't want to, uh, um, you know, take up your time and, and respect uh, the, the schedules that you have and how much you've shared with us. But perhaps any one of you would like to have any closing comments. Um, and again, we're just like super honored that that you're here today. It's really important to hear from you. Okay, so with that, um, thank you everyone so much for joining us today for our esteemed speakers. Um, I do want to let everyone know that uh, we will be sending out a document with the links um, that are uh, been collected in the chat and a link that you can learn more about these incredible women leaders and their work. And um, I think that uh, we have gotten some really clear directive from all of you as we head into COP27. It was really helpful to get your analysis and thoughts as we prepare uh, to come to your homelands. And um, I also uh, think it would be really valuable, as Rita pointed out, you know, a way that everyone can, you know, continue to support all of these women as the COP comes up and their different activities um, and to help amplify their voices. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us. And um, I look forward to seeing you, some of you in person at the COP. It will be really good to, to have it be embodied. Um, so with that, thank you. And we'll go ahead and close our session. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.